Our next paper is uh, by John Mills. He is a civil engineer with over 40 years of experience in civil and water resources engineering in both uh, Great Britain and the United States. He's also a Harriet Watt University alum. Hello, my name's John Millen and I work as a design engineer with Clark County in Washington State in the Pacific Northwest corner of the United States. I'm sorry I can't be over there with you in your tune, but I hope you're all enjoying the Harriet Watt birthday celebration. This part of the program today anticipates the type of work that mechanics institutes like Harriet Watt might be doing in the future. What I'm going to suggest to you here today is that sustainability will continue to be a major ongoing topic for us engineers and that using this organizing principle can help us achieve that objective. First, let's frame this sustainability discussion. Some of you might remember Thomas Malthus from high school history. Tom was a gloomy old English guy who told us we were all going to die because our available farmland could only provide enough food for just so many people, and our population would soon reach that limit. Our food source was unsustainable in modern terms. The answer, though, was that we just needed to get more efficient with our resource management. Enter John Smuts a very interesting character and the only person to sign peace treaties from both the First and Second World Wars. Not content with saving the world though, John turned his attention to trying to save the planet by developing the philosophy of holism. If you want your farmland to be highly productive, you would need to manage it in a holistic way by paying close attention to all your operations and what's more, by managing them all together as one big system. That way you can get more food from that same farmland acreage and so feed a bigger population. So that was John Smut's answer to Malthus's dilemma. So what we're saying here is that being holistic in our resource management might be the best way for us engineers to do our part in the quest for sustainability. So how do we get to holistic? At a simple level, mimicking natural systems, as our biologist pals often ask us to do, seems to make sense. A fuller understanding of the physics of how those natural systems work, though, might be able to help us even more. So what might a holistic method that mimics a natural system mean to us engineers. The premise used here is that natural systems always act to use energy efficiently and minimize energy losses at all times. And so they leave resources in a state of minimum entropy after each process has been completed. By doing that, the resource is always maintained in its highest, most ordered state at the highest energy level possible. Entropy-based resource management is basically about finding simple, effective ways to create or maintain order, to create negative entropy when managing all our resources. Let's apply the principle to one important resource, water and our annual rainfall supply. We'd like to maximize the availability of water to be able to support everybody and everything in our watershed. Can we find an example of natural resource management that might guide us? Well, water in solid phase at the highest potential energy would be snow on the mountaintop. And we know that having a good snowpack is very helpful throughout the year, so we like that. But creating snowpack is a bit hard for us ourselves to do much about. Let's try dropping down a phase. Water in liquid phase at the highest potential energy possible is just high groundwater. So we want that too. And that we might be able to do something about, as we'll see later. 
Let's pause a bit to talk about why entropy-based resource management is used here in the form of an organizing principle. Since we feel this strategy can be useful, we'd like to start applying it right away in all locations at all times as efficiently as possible. So this series of papers focuses on applying the theory in its simplest and most wide-ranging form as an organizing principle. A key secondary objective, though, is to help us make decisions and take action quickly after a reasonable and sufficient analysis has been completed. Here we're remembering that if we mimic a natural system, we're confident of getting good results. Here we see Dad the engineer pondering endlessly over just how big the snowball will get to be by the time it gets to the bottom of the hill, while the family is in meltdown mode waiting to finish their snowman at the bottom. No good can possibly come from all that. Just roll the blooming snowball down the hill. Just make a decision and let's move on. Mum will be happier for one thing. Although the organizing principle was originally developed with water resources in mind, it can equally well be applied to any resource. A literature review was completed to see if there were any existing entropy-based practices around in the energy and transportation fields. The literature review quickly uncovered many research articles demonstrating that entropy-based analysis is in fact central to effective transportation planning. This paper in particular shows it to be a very important factor in maximizing utility for any given population. Maximizing utility is a major goal in developing an effective land use plan. Here we are assessing whether the organizing principle might be useful in addressing climate change. As seen here, sustainability and resiliency seem to have very familiar needs and require similar solutions. The same entropy-based resource management strategies should work for both. In addition, the organizing principle's strong bias in favor of action can be particularly useful for meeting our most urgent resiliency needs. At the same time that we have to work hard on sustainability, we also have a couple of major technological game changers coming our way that we engineers have to plan for and facilitate. Here we're wondering how the organizing principle might help with the upcoming introduction of driverless cars and autonomous vehicles. Well, entropy-based analyses are good at minimizing energy use and so can help us set up good transportation systems servicing a good land use plan. And entropy-based analyses are also a good mathematical way of optimizing travel route choices, whether made by humans or made by robots. In this slide, we're looking at how the organizing principle might interact with smart city and artificial intelligence technology, all due to arrive soon for public works agencies. The organizing principle basically tries to plan, design, and construct effective public infrastructure systems. To maximize that effectiveness, we should incorporate smart infrastructure technology as we build our new infrastructure. AI-enhanced technologies will then help operate and maintain those smart public infrastructure systems even more effectively. Entropy-based resource management is a bit of a mouthful, but we can also use different formulations or frameworks that might make it easier to visualize new strategies. Here we're describing the organizing principle as the efficient storage and frugal use of all our natural resources. The links on this slide show how this formulation relates back to the original entropy concept. And the next couple of slides will illustrate those two bullet points a bit more. First up is efficient storage. Here we're looking at groundwater storage, the water supply for our cells and for all plant and animal life within a watershed. 
The goal is to try to find ways to store our annual rainfall supply as efficiently as possible. Just through observation, we notice that the higher the groundwater elevation is, the greater the storage. So our approach will be simply to work by every means available to establish a high water table everywhere in the watershed. Thinking back to the organizing principle, that's water in liquid phase with high potential energy, a low entropy state. Here we can see that works out well for us. The hops and potatoes are growing, Mick gets his fishing in, and Dad sits down to a nice plate of fish and chips and a pint of IPA. Everybody sustained, everybody happy because we developed a low entropy management system to store our annual rainfall supply efficiently. Now moving on to the frugal use part. We'll use energy here as an example. Public works engineers are not generally in the energy development, energy storage business. In our cities and public infrastructure, we're really more in the mode of being frugal and using that energy. How might we approach doing that? And what practices might already be doing it? Well, a good first step would be to reduce ancillary work. That's the effort and resources expended before you even get to do your real job. Here we see a recent lesson from our experiences with COVID. We've realized that much of the population actually can telecommute and work effectively in their jobs. Telecommuting, that's like linking your computer to a powerful computer in your downtown office. It's kind of like commuting at the speed of light without having to burn some kind of fuel to make that commute. By telecommuting, we've greatly reduced the ancillary work in getting Dad's county road design. And maybe that county road doesn't even need to be so wide anymore. To be able to make everything happen on the ground with all this though, we'll really have to develop and implement some kind of sustainable land use plan for our communities. Here's maybe one way to look at that, planning a new kind of new town. Here the crusty old Scottish engineering professor gives his students some homework. Both Glasgow and Edinburgh are growing fast and now have far too many folk living there. The homework is, how should we deal with all that? This Mechanics Institute student elected to build a new town that would accommodate everybody effectively. He puts his new town halfway in between the two cities. That's not a bad idea, but the crusty old professor knocked off some marks. You should have built a new city on the hills, not in a swamp. And you picked the wrong Scotsman for the name. This is an applied physics problem, not a religious one. It should be named Maxwell Town after James Clark Maxwell, the physicist, not named after David Livingston, the missionary. In any event, as resources get scarcer and problems increase, the development of some kind of sustainable land use plan will presumably be needed to help us reach sustainability. And entropy-based resource management can make it all happen. Paradigms lost. Having used this organizing principle for some time now, I've come to think that quite a few of today's priorities and paradigms are important but insufficient to get us all to sustainability. The organizing principle considers all resources at the same time, is well grounded in physics, and focuses on the key driving processes, all of which I think can help us move forward a bit quicker. For example, in the first bullet here, before we even get to discussing using different energy types, we should really try first to eliminate any unnecessary work. That's the ancillary work seen in the earlier examples. I'd say these are maybe the main resource management suggestions that have come out of using the organizing principles so far. But you yourselves can find many more if you take a look at your own work from the organizing principles perspective. What we've done in this series of articles is essentially retest sustainability as an applied physics problem 
that is as an engineering problem. When we do that, we put the sustainability focus on engineering, with the leading role falling to us engineers. Sure, we engineers can be a bit annoying, and maybe we didn't get everything 100% right the first time. But engineers create the built environment, and engineering is still the indispensable profession if we're ever going to get us all to economic and environmental sustainability. All roads to sustainability run through entropy. Best information I can give you all today. Enjoy your birthday celebration and cheers to the next 200 years. Well, thank you so much. What a fascinating talk. And um, I love that, that one of the papers in this session really talks about the role of, of our institutes in an issue as important as sustainability. There are some really thoughtful comments in the chat. And um, I, uh, I don't think I saw specific questions, but something that I think is a theme in, in some of these uh, comments is the potential opportunity for the Mechanics Institute network uh, to have an impact on, on this topic. Uh, so a question I'd love to ask you is if you could lay out uh, two or three things that mechanics institutes could do around these ideas you've presented, if you were gonna give us a to-do list, um, what would be on that? Uh, I, I would say uh, the, the main thing I came up with through all of this was, um, we really need to look at our land use planning because I'm on the infrastructure side, public works side. So relative to that, I think the biggest thing we can do is look at it, take another look at our land use planning. Um, and uh, probably um, take a look at some hierarchies. Right now we've got a lot of environmental um, topics, a lot of experts in every topic. But what I really found thinking through all this was that we need to establish hierarchies. And um, on the water resources side, which is what I, I work on in particular, um, the real thing that came to me was that the primary uh, objective to achieve is to uh, promote high groundwater everywhere. So when you promote high groundwater, you are maximizing the storage in your ground, in the ground and in your surface water also. And that I think is the primary objective. Uh, there's a lot of downstream uh, benefits from that. Um, there's, there's obviously very, other very important things like wetlands, for instance, but um, I do think that high groundwater, they provide the hydro period for the wetlands. And so, you know, it could be the best wetland in the world, but if the water drops a few feet, it's not going to last. So I, I think establishing some hierarchies and uh, I'd also say take another look at land use planning and um, the thing I came up with actually, one of the promising um, prospects there is what they call a 20 minute neighborhood where people live and can access everything they need within a 20 minute walk or cycle. And um, so that minimizes uh, the energy needs for, for everything, um, comes with health benefits for the population. Uh, but if you think about that, um, I used to, I used to uh, I'm a graduate of Harry Watt, and I used to live in Gorgie Road, and Edinburgh actually has them. Um, Gorgie Road, I was uh, top flat um, below my house was the fish and chip shop, the pub was there, the uh, crosser, the Fruiterer, the fishmonger, everything was there at the bottom of the stair. 
And then when I walked out, I could get a bus, mass transit to anywhere in Edinburgh. So um, our situation in the United States is quite different. We're much more spread out. But we really need to get back to what Edinburgh was already doing. Perhaps Edinburgh needs to revisit. Um, they probably have expanded a lot since I lived there. And maybe they need to revisit and kind of go back to the old style of planning. So land use planning and then just a rethink of paradigms and hierarchies and apply some hierarchies, perhaps. Yeah, I do, I do think mechanics institutes would be very well placed here um, to move into this kind of thing. Yeah, I can absolutely see that. At, at RIT, we have an institute for sustainability, and I think many other mechanics institutes that have become universities are, are focused on practical problems that matter for people, and this is, this is certainly one of those. Uh, there's some wonderful comments in the chat if you haven't had a chance to take a look at them. Um, lots of ideas there as well.